गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो इन कंटिन्यूशन टूडे इट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टॉपिक प्रोग्नोस्टिक टूल्स इन पेशेंट विद एडवांस कैंसर रिलेटिव केयर फिजिशियंस और फॉर एम डीज और डी एन डीज एंड फॉर एवरी वन ऑल ऑफ फर्स्ट it's always remain a daily prognosis and i think there's everything whatever i can uh, uh, last time also i've told that whatever we speak we should speak with evidence so this is the best best um, uh, one hour i think you will see that how we should prognosticate a patient who is in the stage uh, advanced stage of cancer and for this and the best team of uh, this uh, i i consider the manipal team is uh, one of the best team in country uh, with the in this team uh, dr kritika we all know kritika very well she is uh, uh, she is and uh, she is becoming a very upcoming uh, brilliant uh, palliative care physician again participating in lot of uh, academic activities as well as research activities and she is team uh, she is a one of a important team member from the wins team uh, she is her area of interest are pediatric palliative care neuro palliative care and icu palliative care and uh, she will be moderating this uh, seminar and i request kritika to introduce gayatri because now gayatri is second year resident and you must be knowing a lot about gayatri so please introduce gayatri and start the topic Anyone wants to write any question or uh, comments? Please write down in the chat box. Doctor Kritika will take up at the end. Go ahead, Kritika. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Shukma, ma'am. Good morning to you and good morning to everybody else who has joined in for the session. It was nice to hear from you, ma'am, and thank you so much for introducing me to the whole group. And um, it is uh, really. Uh, You know, wonderful to see guys. She also step up here and present here in the IIPC Academy. She is a junior resident in second year right now. She joined in last year in Feb in February, uh, 2022. This year, she's the first batch. And in these uh, ten months, they have really, uh, you know, you know, really learned so much. And they have been. She's a really efficient student. And and I'm happy that she's presenting today on the topic of prognostic tools in patients with advanced cancer. So without much ado, Gayatri, you can start your presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. My topic for today is prognostic tools in patients with advanced cancer. To help us better understand the prognostic tools, let us first understand what is prognosis, the prognostic factors, and clinician prediction of survival. the prognostic tools that we will be discussing are glasgow prognostic score palliative performance scale palliative prognostic score palliative prognostic index and prognosis and palliative care study prognosis it is a branch of clinical epidemiology that is defined as relative probabilities of various outcomes of the natural history of a disease there are five outcomes that can be predicted which are referred to as the five t's we have the death Death recurrence, uh, disease recurrence, disability, drug toxicity, and dollars. To so these may be added a sixth D, that is derivatives or the impact on the health of others caused by the illness. The three components of prognostication are formulating the prognosis, communicating the prognosis, and using prognosis when making a clinical decision. In our subsequent discussion, we'll explore how to formulate prognosis. formulating prognosis could either be done by subjective judgment by clinician this is known as clinician prediction of survival or we have the actuarial judgment which is an objective method that relies on the statistical data such as median survivals and hazard ratios and eliminates the need for human judge firstly let's look into clinician prediction of survival this is the most common approach to estimating survival in patients with cancer the three general forms are the temporal approach that is how long will this patient live surprise questions would i be surprised if this patient died in specific time frame the probabilistic approach what is the probability of survival of this patient in specific time frame temporal approach the temporal approach and clinician prediction of survival refers to the use of time as a factor in predicting the likelihood of survival of a patient 
This approach is commonly used in medical prognosis. In the temporal approach, clinicians consider how much time has passed since the onset of disease or condition, as well as the rate of progression of the disease. These approaches can involve analyzing patterns of change over time in a patient's vital signs, laboratory test results, or other clinical measures to estimate the likelihood of surviving a particular condition or treatment. One such example of temporal approach in clinician prediction of survival is the use of time series analysis, which involves analyzing data collected at regular intervals over a period of time to identify trends or patterns that may be indicative of changes in a patient's health status. Next, we, our next component of CPS is the surprise question. It offers an alternative to standard prognostic estimate. It is a screening tool that aims to identify people nearing the end of life. It does not require clinicians to collect clinical data or to use a scoring algorithm, nor does it require clinicians to make a specific estimate about the length of survival. It simply asks whether the respondent would be surprised if the patient were to die within a specific time period. It was originally developed by Joan Lin as a method to identify patients who might benefit from palliative care services. Nicola White and her team reviewed 22 studies with outcomes of 25,718 estimates, wherein a response of no, I would not be surprised to the surprise question was given on 6,495 occasions and clinicians' intuitions were correct in 82% of the cases. The sensitivity of surprise questions ranged between 11.6 and 95.6%, and a range of 13.8 to 98.2 was reported for specificity. On, a meta on meta analysis, the pool level of accuracy, that is, the number of times the clinicians correctly predicted the outcome of a patient, was 74.8%. Thus, it was concluded that accuracy of surprise questions may be higher in oncology patients than in any other disease groups. Next component of CPS is the probabilistic approach. Probabilistic approach is when clinicians gather data on survival rates for similar patients in the past and use this data to estimate the probability of survival for a particular patient. This may involve using statistical models and techniques such as regression analysis or survival analysis to analyze data and make predictions. Another systematic review by Nicola White on how accurate were clinicians in predicting survival concluded that probabilistic form of CPS may outperform the temporal approach. Thus, by, uh, thus by limiting time frame of prediction, both the surprise questions and probabilistic questions appear to predict survival more accurately than the temporal approach of CPS. In a 2015 review conducted by Stephanie Sheon and her team on accuracy of clinicians' prediction of survival in advanced cancer patients, it was observed that out of 15 studies, clinicians in five studies underestimated patient survival. In contrast, 12 studies reported clinicians' overestimation of survival. Hence, the study highlights the need to further investigate the formulation of better survival prediction tools, or perhaps the use of clinician prediction survival in combination with other tools to predict survival. Candidate prognostic factors in patients with advanced cancer that helps to improve clinician prediction of survival include tumor-related factors, patient-related factors, and environmental factors. Tumor-related factors include the anatomic extent and tumor bulk, histological grading, genetic makeup, tumor marker level, tumor molecular biology, and disease-free interval. Anatomic extent, that is the size and location of the tumor. For example, a cancer that is limited to one organ or area of the body may be more easily treated with surgery, chemotherapy, or radiotherapy, and may have better prognosis than a metastatic cancer. Next is the histological grading. Tumors are generally classified as low, intermediate, and high-grade based on their histology. In general, low-grade tumors tend to grow more slowly and have better prognosis. Genetic makeup. Cancer itself can't be passed down from parents to children, and genetic changes in tumor cells can't be passed down either. But a genetic change that increases the risk of cancer can be inherited if it is present in the parent's egg or sperm cells. For example, if a parent passes a mutated BARCA1 or BARCA2 gene to their child, the child will have much higher risk of developing breast and several other cancers. 
inheriting a cancer related genetic gene genetic gene change doesn't mean you will definitely get cancer it means that your risk of getting cancer is increased tumor molecular biology refers to genetic and molecular makeup of tumor certain molecular changes that can be associated with poorer prognosis include keras or p53 mutations on the other hand some molecular changes may be associated with better prognosis for example hormone receptor positive breast cancers tend to have better prognosis because they can be treated with hormone therapies next we have is a, a patient related factors such as demographics like age and gender performance status symptoms laboratory parameters psychological status quality of life and comorbidities patient with comorbidities have a poorer prognosis due to greater likelihood of complications during treatment and decreased ability to tolerate treatment performance status performance status has proven to be an independent prognostic parameter performance status refers to measure of patient's physical and functional status which can be used to assess their ability to undergo treatment and their overall prognosis performance status is typically assessed using scales such as the karnovsky's performance status activities of daily living eastern cooperative oncology group ecog and palliative performance scale in a systematic review of 24 studies it was found that performance status along with symptoms uh, such as cognitive failure weight loss dysphagia anorexia and dyspnea were independent survival predictors in terminal cancer patients this is a table that compares and correlates the karnovsky's performance status and ecog status kps allows patients to be classified by their functional impairment this can be used to compare effectiveness of different therapies and to assess prognosis in individual patients the lower the karnovsky score the worse the survival for most serious illnesses a score between 100 to 80 indicates that patient is able to carry on with normal activity and work no special care is needed which is equivalent to ecog 0 to 1 KPIs between 70 to 50 suggest you of inability to work with requiring varying amounts of assistance. KPIs of 40 to 10 requires institutional or hospital care as patient is unable to care for self. In a retrospective analysis of 6310 patients admitted to palliative care services, demographic and performance status as per KPIs and ECOG was retrieved and the overall survival of the patients calculated. according to the performance status no large differences were associated with ecog and kps though results slightly favor karnovsky's performance status next uh, next let's look at how does the physical signs and symptoms affect prognosis symptoms linked to survival include shortness of breath dry mouth eating problems or anorexia difficulty in swallowing and weight loss terminal cancer syndrome hypothesis it is characterized by reduction in the functional state of the patient and symptoms of the cancer anorexia cachexia syndrome cancer anorexia cachexia syndrome describes a syndrome of progressive weight loss anorexia with persistent erosion of body host body cell mass in response to malignant growth the main pathophysiology underlying this includes a decline in food intake related to energy expenditure abnormalities of host carbohydrate protein and fat metabolism leading to continued mobilization and ineffective repletion of host tissue despite adequate nutritional support cachectin or tumor necrosis factor or other host derived cytokines produced as a defense against mal malignancy have been implicated as signal molecules in cachexia so here we have the definite and probable factors that could contribute to pro prognosticating a patient definite factors include uh, cps that is clinician's prediction of survival performance status signs and symptoms of cancer anorexia cachexia syndrome uh, symptoms with independent prognostic values such as delirium dyspnea biological factors such as leukocytosis lymphocytopenia and raised crp and last but not the least we have the prognostic scores possible factors that could help in prognostication of patients include patient demographics tumor characteristics signs and symptoms biological factors such as anemia hypo and pre hypoalbuminemia uh, serum calcium and sodium levels ldh and other enzymes 
So let's have a quick look into the environmental factors that could affect prognosis, and these include the choice of treatment, quality of treatment, access to care, healthcare policies, and access to drugs or technology. Recent update on prognostication in advanced cancer mentions the following prognostic tools, that is the Glasgow Prognostic Score, Palliative Performance Scale, Palliative Prognostic Score, Palliative Prognostic Index, and Prognosis and Palliative Care Study. First prognostic tool that we will be discussing is the Glasgow Prognostic Score. This is a cumulative prognostic score based on C-reactive protein and albumin levels. A CRP of less than or equal to 10 gives a score of 0, irrespective of serum albumin levels. A CRP of more than 10 and serum albumin greater than or equal to 3.5 gives a score of 1. A CRP of more than 10 and serum albumin less than 3.5 attributes a score of 2. With increasing score, there is worsening prognosis. It was first proposed as a prognostic indicator in patients with undissectable lung cancer, and its prognostic significance has been validated in different types of cancers. One such study is a meta-analysis wherein 43 independent cohorts from 41 studies with colorectal cancer patients were included. Correlation between Glasgow prognostic score and overall survival was analyzed and revealed that patients with elevated GPS were associated with poor overall survival. Pre-treatment GPS is hence a useful biomarker in management of colorectal cancers. This is another study on significance of GPS in urological cancers enrolled 20 studies in this meta-analysis. The outcomes reveal that lower the level of of pre-treatment GPS was associated with better overall survival, cancer-specific survival, as well as disease-free survival. 124 patients diagnosed with stage 4 esophageal squamous cell carcinoma were included in this study. The values of CRP to albumin ratio, Glasgow prognostic score, prognostic nutritional index, neutrophil to lymphocytic ratio, and platelet to lymphocyte ratio were calculated from pre-treatment blood sampling results and of patients who received chemotherapy, and the therapeutic effect and prognosis were analyzed. It was observed that high CRP to albumin groups and GPS of one or two groups correlated with significantly worse prognosis regarding both disease-specific survival and overall survival. Hence, evaluation of pre-treatment CRP and albumin in locally advanced esophageal cancers lead to useful prognostic prediction. Next, we have is a 2007 comparative study between GPS and ECOG performance status in patients receiving palliative chemotherapy for gastroesophageal cancers. This study recruited 65 patients with gastroesophageal carcinoma who presented to the Royal Infirmary uh, Glasgow Institute between January 1998 and December 2005, who received palliative chemo or chemoradiotherapy. ECOG, CRP, and albumin were recorded at diagnosis, and toxicity was recorded using common toxicity criteria. This study reveals that a uh, presence of systemic inflammatory response, as evidenced by the GPS, appears to be superior to the subjective assessment of performance status in predicting the response to platinum-based chemotherapy in patients with advanced esophageal cancers. The next tool that we will be discussing is the palliative performance scale. Palliative performance scale was first introduced in 1996 as a new tool for measurement of performance status in palliative care patients. It assesses five functional parameters, ambulation, activity level and evidence of disease, self-care, intake, and conscious levels. First, we have is the ambulation that could range from full, where there is no restriction or assistance required, to totally bed-bound, wherein the patient is unable to get out of bed or do self-care. Activity and evidence of disease. Activity refers to normal activities linked to daily routine, housework, and uh, hobbies or leisure. Evidence of disease. No evidence of disease when the individual is normal and healthy with no physical or uh, investigative evidence of disease. The term some significant and extensive disease refers to physical or investigative evidence which shows disease progression, sometimes despite active treatments. 
Self care could range from being able to do all normal activities such as transfer out of bed, walk, wash, and eat without ass assistance to requiring assistance always for all care. Normal intake is when the individual eats normal amount of food and it is said to be reduced when now intake is less than normal amounts when healthy. As the malignancy progresses, there may be no oral intake at all and only mouth care, mouth care continues. The last parameter is the conscious level. A, a patient could be fully conscious, that is fully alert and oriented with normal cognitive abilities or could be drowsy or coma with or without confusion where there is no response to verbal or physical stimuli. Some reflexes may or may not remain. The depth of coma may fluctuate through a 24 hour period and usually indicates imminent death. Based on these functional parameters, we have the palliative performance scale in 10% decrements from 100% that is fully ambulatory and healthy to zero being dead. The reliability and validity study of palliative performance scale demonstrated that it is a reliable tool useful for prognostication, disease monitoring, care planning, and hospital resource allocation. The validity study found that most experts did not feel a need to further modify palliative performance scale. Also, PPS is a good communication tool between palliative care workers. Barbara Head and her team conducted a study to explore the application of palliative performance scale as a tool for projecting length of stay until death or discharge in a home-based hospice program. Records of 396 patients between Jan uh, 2001 and March 31, 2001 were reviewed. Palliative performance score was associated with length of survival. Negative change in scores, that is decline in PPS, were predictive of patient decline towards death while stable uh, scores ratings over time resulted in discharge consideration. Another prognostic tool that we have is the palliative prognostic score, abbreviated as PAP. Uh, it uses symptoms and signs, performance status, and lab parameters into consideration to prognosticate a patient. As discussed in previous slides, dyspnea and anorexia are independent prognostic factors, as is the performance status. Palliative prognostic score also takes into consideration clinicians' prediction of sur uh, survival, uh, probable duration of survival in weeks. Lab parameters such as leukocytosis and lymphocytopenia indicate worsening prognosis. Based on the cumulative score and expected survival, patients could be categorized into following risk groups. A score of 0 to 5.5 is suggestive of more than 70% probability of 30 day survival. A score of 5.6 to 11 suggests that the 30 day survival probability is between 30 to 70%, and the probability is less than 30% if the score is more than 11. In a multi center study conducted by Marco and his team, the palliative prognostic score was designed to predict 30 day survival of patients referred to palliative care services. The palliative prognostic score was tested in a population of 451 patients entered in the hospice programs. The performance of PAP score index was evaluated by comparing mortality rates in three prognostic risk categories. The study revealed that continuous integration of subjective judgment with series of more objective parameters together with attention to an evaluation of life expectancy contributes to improved prognostic abilities. In this pro uh, prospective study, PAP score was documented in hospitalized patients seen by palliative care. A total of 216 patients were enrolled with median survival of 109 days. It was observed that PAP score was more accurate than clinician prediction of survival and that the addition of clinician prediction survival to the prognostic model actually reduced its accuracy. Palliative Prognostic Index. It relies on the assessment of performance status using the palliative performance scale, oral intake, and presence or absence of dyspnea, edema, and delirium. But it does not require blood tests or incorporate clinician prediction of survival. A PPI score of more than six is predictive of shorter survival, less than three weeks, and a score of less than uh, a score of more than six.
Uh, PPI score of more than six is predictive of shorter survival less than three weeks, and a score of less than or equal to four is predictive of survival of more than six weeks. A study published in the Journal of Pain and Symptom Management found that PPI was able to accurately predict survival in palliative care patients with high degree of accuracy. Another study published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology also found that palliative prognostic index was a reliable tool for predicting survival in palliative care patients with advanced cancer. Palliative prognostic index was devised and validated in patients with cancer in a hospice inpatient unit in Japan. Now, 194 patients were recruited in this study, 43% of whom were receiving chemotherapy and or radiotherapy or both. The aim of the study was to test its accuracy in different population in a range of care settings and in those receiving palliative chemotherapy and radiotherapy. The study demonstrated improved accuracy of phys physician survival prediction with the use of palliative prognostic index. The last tool that we will be discussing is a prognosis in palliative care study. On a multivariate ana uh, analysis, 11 core variables were, uh, predict uh, were uh, independently predictive of both two-week and two-month survival. The core variables include pulse rate, general health status, mental test score, performance status, presence of anorexia, or presence of any uh, site of metastatic disease, presence of liver meds, CRP, WBC, platelet count, and urea. Separate prognostic models were created for patients without or with blood results. Palli uh, pro uh, prognosis and palliative case study consists of four different prognostic models. We have PIPS A14 and A56, which predicts 14-day and 56-day survival in patients when no blood tests are available. PIPS B14 and 56 predict 14 day and 56 day survival when now blood results are available. So uh, this is a table that is uh, extracted online from an uh, online calculator of PIPSA. It includes uh, the following parameters. Diagnosis, that is presence of primary breast cancer or prostate cancer. Liver, met uh, liver metastasis, bone metastasis, and any site of metastatic disease, including liver or bone. Then we have the abbreviated mental test score. Abbreviated mental test score is a 10-point test for rapidly assessing the possibility of dementia. The outcomes, uh, the questions asked are age in years, time of day, name of the hospital, memorizing address, recognizing a person, current year, name of the prime minister, date of birth, counting 20 to 1, and recalling address. Pulse, loss of appetite during last week, breathlessness at rest during the last week, difficulty swallowing, the, uh, difficulty swallowing during the past week, and loss of weight in the last month are uh, questions asked to the patient to uh, get the PIPSA score. Apart from that, we assess for the general health and performance status using ECOG performance status ranging from 0 to 4, global health status again ranging from 1 to 7, 1 being very poor and 7 to being excellent. Clinicians estimate is also uh, here, uh, estimate will not be used to calculate the prognostic score. In a recent study, the PIPSA survival risk categories were found to be less accurate than an agreed multi-professional estimate between a doctor and a nurse for predicting whether patients would survive for days, weeks, or months. For this reason, it is not recommended that the PIPSA score should be used in clinical practice in its current form, and that it should be used only for research purposes. PIPSB, uh, that is Prognosis and Palliative Care Study B, uh, apart from diagnosis, and uh, uh, symptoms and signs. In addition, it uses blood results uh, such as total white count, neutrophil count, lymphocyte count, platelet count, urea, serum uh, alanine transaminase levels, alkaline phosphatase levels, albumin and C-reactive protein as well into consideration to prognosticate a patient. PIPSB survival risk categories are as accurate as an agreed multi-professional estimate between a doctor and a nurse at predicting whether patients will survive for days, weeks, or months. 
So this is a table that shows the data that are required for calculation of PIPS A and B. For both, we use the ECOG performance status, general health status, and abbreviated mental test score. Primary breast cancer has an independent pro uh, prognostic value in PIPS A. In PIPS B, even primary prostate cancer, distant metastasis, uh, presence of bone metastasis and anorexia also have uh, commonly have independent prognostic value. Apart from the uh, these, the blood results are a, a prognostic have prognostic value in PIPSP. So to summarize, we have three main components of medical interventions, which is diagnosis, therapy, and prognosis. Of these, prognosis is the least studied aspect in scientific literature. The theme of prognosis is critical in terms of how it is formulated and communicated by physicians to patients and relatives. Clinician prediction survival alone is fairly inaccurate and often presents a bias towards patient uh, towards overestimation. With the aim of providing clinicians with easy to use support tools, numerous authors have tried to integrate specific prognostic factors into prognostic scores used in palliative settings. So to summarize, these are the prognostic tools that we have discussed, palliative prognostic index, uh, the parameters involved here are palliative uh, oral intake, edema, dyspnea at rest, and delirium. For a palliative prognostic score, uh, the parameters include dyspnea, anorexia, Karnowski's performance scale, clinician prediction of survival, and uh, blood parameters such as total white counts and lymphocyte percentage. In Glasgow prognostic score, we have uh, C-reactive protein and albumin levels that are assessed to prognosticate a patient. And lastly, we discussed as a prognosis and palliative care study models, A and B. In B, we have the additional uh, blood tests that are uh, evaluated for prognosticating a patient. Thank you. Hello, I'm so sorry. Uh, there's some issue with my network in my area. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Dr. Kritika, we can hear you. Yeah. Yes, we can. Uh, sorry, thank you. So, uh, with uh, regards to the, uh, I was talking about in prognostication, which is an important aspect when we are dealing with our patients, uh, both from oncology and non oncology, as well as patients who are receiving active disease directed treatment and all. So with regards to when you talk about when Dr. Gayatri mentioned in the start of her slide about the various steps involved, one of the most important is communication. Now, there was a paper in 2019 by, uh, authored by Dr. Arun uh, Vangshu Goshal and the rest of the team who looked at 250 patients and 250 caregivers, whether they should be revealed their cancer diagnosis and the prognosis. And it was astounding that, you know, when we feel that in our culture, that patients are more protected, family is the main decision maker, and hence we continue to communicate only with the family members. We never are able to assess what about the patient who is undergoing treatment. They, it is utmost priority because autonomy lies with them. And hence it is important that we also look into how much they would like to receive information and know about their diagnosis and eventually prognosis later. So that study revealed that maximum number of patients who were interviewed said they would like to know about their diagnosis and prognosis. And hence, for us as palliative care professionals, it becomes very important for us to take into this aspect when we are seeing our patients, especially uh, the ones who are on active cancer treatment, to know the uh, how are they doing well on these treatment protocols, uh, whether are they declining in health, for us to be able to step up and discuss with the uh, primary team, look at making some uh, advanced care planning or goals of care discussions with such patients and their families. Kritika, there are some questions. Can you take up these questions? Yes. Yes, madam. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Geeta Ramamurthy, madam, has asked, which is the one to use? Uh, when we look at in our setting, it is not only one particular that you would use. The recent study talks about you know, prediction, uh, you know, survival prediction models. 
whether they take into all of these aspects, that is the CPS, that is the clinical prediction score, as well as using one of the PPI, which is the very simple tool to use in our setting. Hence, it is important that we consider these aspects together. Uh, Vidya Madam has asked about prognostication in children. Now, in, uh, there are no separate tools that they have come up with in uh, population with children. But in study models in our, they have taken into context the uh, PIPS and the PPI score to be used in, although it's not validated in our setting or in any particular children's setting, madam. Dr. Kritika, there was a question from Dr. Rajesh Mahajan also. Oh, sorry, I missed that question. I don't have yeah. the chat. Which is better palliative prognostic scale or PPI? Better palliative prognostic scale or PPI? Yeah. No, palliative prognostic scale is part in the PPI itself. So it has to be uh, not like an individual tool used in particularly. It is about, I, I said, as I answered the earlier question, that it is, a, it is two, three different models that you're going to be using together. It is the, it is the prediction survivability uh, question that you will ask. Then you'll also look at the PPI index and as well as taking into laboratory values, which is because recent studies, which is done recently in 2019, there was a paper by Dr. David Hui and an ASCO guideline, as well as an ESCO guideline, which suggests using a uh, using three, four days different tools, which is talked about in the uh, PIPS A and B study and recently in 2021, it is published in, which takes into all of these aspects together has helps us in better survival prediction rather than just using the surprise question alone or using the PPI alone. Uh, Dr. Kritika, can you see the question from Dr. Punita? Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's not about uh, prognosticate once or prognosticating at some intervals. It is uh, how we actually practice in our, our setting also. I'll give you an example. So now we have a patient who has uh, come up with an advanced cancer, a metastatic disease. As per ESCO guidelines and mass guidelines, any patient with metastatic disease has to have you know, palliative care inputs. So such patients are referred at our center. And now when they are undergoing cancer treatment, now the estimate by which the uh, oncologist will you know, tell the family or the patient as to what would be the likelihood chances of chemotherapy or radiation therapy uh, effect or how much will it really you know, gain you know, survival for this patient. They look into survival studies that are done for patients who are, there are a lot of randomized control studies done, which talk about, they, they show the survival curves of patients who are undergoing any disease modifying therapy as against the standard arm. So the, usually the standard arm will be the best supportive care arm. So that is a very, uh, one of the ways where oncologists use to predict survival in patients who are undergoing treatment and give that estimate even to the families, say in say like 20% survival at so many months or 50% survival at so many months. So that is another way of prediction which oncologists use. Now, when we are looking at such patients in our treatments, we also take into account of their performance status. We take into account their laboratory values, development of the cancer treatment related complications or cancer related complications. So when you come across these points, you could use your, uh, uh, you, could, you could use in terms of for your personal way to understand where did this patient lie along the disease trajectory so that you'll be able to communicate or discuss with the parent unit, about the oncologist about what is the likelihood of the treatment effect? Is there gonna be any chances of improvement or survival so that you can discuss with the family? So such transition points you could consider trying to check for it and then go back with the treating team, come back and discuss with the family and see where they are aligned with their goals or not, or do they still need some time? So it gives you a very objective way of assessing, but at the same time, helps you in communicating uh, for the goals of care with the family and the patient. I hope Dr. Punita was able to answer your question. Thank you. Anyone wants to add any comments? Vidya, you have any, uh, do you want to add anything from your experience in this topic? 
Good morning, madam. Thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, my experience, I mean, I've always used the PPS scale for every patient because I think it helps us to keep longitudinal, uh, um, what do we call, follow-up in the sense all of these scales are most useful if they are done longitudinally. So that is when it tells us the difference. So that's why the point that she brought up when she was talking about the PPS scale is that it is a good tool among co-workers is significant because that's the way we communicate with each other when patient is on home care, when patient is transitioning. And it also helps to triage our patients, which of our patients need our care the most. So uh, I think using a scale should be a part of every palliative care setup. And that becomes a nice objective way of communicating with our oncologists, with our co-workers, with family, and actually understanding uh, the trajectory of the patient. And the most important thing in PPS, which I always mention, and I think most of us will, is the way you read the scale. So how you go from left to right and how the scale should be read is very important, not just the points. So a detailed reading of the scales that you do and documenting it in every visit, I think is important. And we, uh, I think you. it would be nice to do something in pediatrics because uh, you don't really have anything validated there. Yes. Thank yes. you, madam. Thank you, Vidya. Dr. Kalpana, you, wanted, you have written some comments. Can you speak, please? And there is one question from Rajesh Mahajan again. Uh, Pratika, you can take up at, uh, yes. after Dr. Kalpana. Hello. Yes, Dr. Hello. Kalpana. Good morning. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, basically, I just wanted to say that since in palliative care, we talk about uh, if the deterioration is in weeks and months and days, uh, the palliative performance scale should also be repeated at these intervals, which Avidya already spoke about. You know, If you keep on repeating them, we get a better idea of the prognosis. Yes. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank uh, you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalpana. There is a, a comment from Dr. Rajesh. What is meant to repeat prognostic score in a patient after initial prognostication? So I think Dr. Vidya has answered. Uh, Dr. Rajesh? Yes. Kritika, you want to reply? Uh, Ma'am, uh, that's what regarding the transition points, as we mentioned about the same thing as I uh, earlier answering, is that when we see these uh, change in, uh, I mean, it now depends upon that, uh, as an example, initial prognostication we would have done and we would have expected as uh, Kalpana Madam mentioned that say it is months, but then you see that the patient has come again with some other complication at this point of time, maybe there was be an infection and overwhelming sepsis or is undergoing treatment and has developed overwhelming sepsis and the, and the clinician has decided that no further cancer-directed treatment, that probably the disease has progressed and uh, a patient has come with a very poor performance status. So again, that would also help you that that point. That is an, again another transition point for you to see that previous visit, the PPI was showing or the PPS was showing that it must be in months. But now with this particular episode and after providing management for that particular in, uh, you know, medical insult, you have again wanted to see the pr uh, prediction whether how much is the prognosis or survival present and it comes to weeks. So that transition point should be rather used uh, instead of every visit. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, uh, so I, I think this was an important topic. Important topic in the sense that people, those who are practicing palliative care, they should have a, some kind of a, a parameters, some kind of a scale when they are prognosticating their patient. If you will not be knowing all these based on the evidence, I think people will listen to you because it is always an interdisciplinary and to make them understand, you have to speak evidence. Plus, it, it will be always be a gray zone. You have to have an experience based on these skills, based on your communications, based on the patient's autonomy, family's choices, everything will come together and you will <clears throat> make a final decision that this is the way I'm going to plan the goals of care for my patient. So uh, please remember all these scales, keep this in your mind. Plus, 
i will request uh, that we should create our own scale that um, as vidya said that for pediatrics there are no scales but in indian scenario which scale will means like these all these scales for uh, for indian patients also but uh, a comprehensive scale because there were, today there were a lot of questions that which scale i should use which scale i should use so uh, maybe uh, we can uh, after some time we can say that this is the scale which uh, uh we can use for our patient something like this so thank you kritika and gayatri thank you vidya kalpana anyone if they wants to have any comments please <clears throat> raise your hands otherwise we will stop here and uh, we will see you next week um, before 6:30 so kritika last point last comment do you want to say something thank you so much ma'am uh Yes, I agree with what you just mentioned about. Uh, there are various questions about everyone having what kind of tools to be used in. So this was an entire uh, presentation itself was for you to understand in general what different tools are there, and based on the recent studies and the ASCO and ESMO recommendations, it is a it is not one tool that helps us in prediction. It is the objective and subjective assessment should be utilized in such setting. Thank Very you so good. much, ma'am, for this opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Pratika and Gayatri. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nisha and Archana. Mm -hmm. We will see you next week, uh, but in next year. So uh, this year went off really well. We did a lot of uh, academic activities, including this uninterrupted uh, academic lectures on Monday. So we will see you next week. Uh, next week in next to twenty twenty three. Uh, uh, till the time you enjoy the rest of the year, and uh, see you in the next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nisha, Archana, Kritika, uh, Gayatri, uh, Kalpana, everyone. Those who have joined. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.